The final month of season one of British history, royals, rebels, and romantics. I can't thank you all enough for joining me on this journey. It's been amazing. I've loved sharing the stories of fascinating characters from the past who can teach us so much about ourselves and our future. History shows us what's possible. This month, we're looking at family fun. First, some Stuart siblings. When brothers and then sisters take the throne. Then, just in time for Father's Day in the U.S., it's famous fathers and missing fathers in royal history. And finally, for our season one finale, I am thrilled to have Rebecca Larson of Tudor's Dynasty podcast join me to talk about one of her favorite family disputes in Tudor times. And this gives us what might just be the best line ever written in a letter. Now, sit back and enjoy the fun, the fractures, the fashions, and the frustrations that make up families. Since Father's Day is right around the corner here in the U.S., I thought it would be fun to take a look at some of the royal fathers in history. So today we'll look at some very famous and some a bit less famous but still fascinating fathers in British royal history. They check all the boxes, royals, rebels, and even a few romantics. For much of royal histories, kings literally ruled. And a king's primary job description was to ensure peace and prosperity at home, protect against enemies abroad, and secure the succession. Be a judge, be a soldier, be a dad. As King's success was typically judged against these criteria, at least through the Middle Ages and into the 16th and beginning of the 17th century. Then queens took the throne, which shifted the focus on family roles somewhat. Parliament began to take more control. A constitutional monarchy emerged. Still, the focus on fathers continued well into the 20th century. We're going to take a look at five royal fathers, Henry II, Edward III, Henry VIII, Prince Albert, and George VI. For all, for all of them, we'll be considering this well-known question, does father know best? Henry II. We'll start with a first and a second first Plantagenet king and second husband of Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry II. Henry's mother, Matilda, claimed the throne when her father died in 1135, but her cousin Stephen of Blois was crowned king instead. Henry joined his mother in her battle for the throne, eventually coming to an agreement with Stephen that he would be the heir. When Henry was 19, he made a very profitable mar marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine. One of the wealthiest heiresses of the time, Eleanor had just an older marriage to the King of France. She married Henry eight weeks later. All of Eleanor's lands came with her, which meant Henry now controlled more French land than the French king. In 1150, Henry and Eleanor became king and queen of England. Henry went to work getting things settled in England after years of civil war and chaos. He established the basis for common law, and gained authority over the nobility. His efforts to secure the Plantagenet dynasty were matched by Eleanor, who went to work providing heirs. Eleanor and Henry had eight children, seven of whom lived to adulthood, including four sons, young Henry, Richard, Geoffrey, and John. So Henry was the father of the Plantagenets, and he did that pretty well, getting the country on the right track and creating a dynasty that would last 300 years. He also had a respectable number of actual sons, four. So how would he rate as a father? As a family man, Henry II was effective early on when it came to producing sons. But as the kids grew up, he lost it a bit. Henry struggled to distribute various parts of the kingdom to his sons, especially to his youngest and reportedly favorite son, John. 
nicknamed Lackland because as the youngest son, there wasn't much land left to give him, John naturally wanted more. To shore up support for the dynasty and the future, Henry II decided to have his heir, young Henry, crowned as a sort of co-ruler. Now known as the Young King, Prince Henry was frustrated. He had the title of king, but nothing to rule, especially when he saw his brother Richard wielding real power as Duke of Aquitaine. Overall discontent with their father was something Henry's sons could agree on, and in 1173, the boys rebelled against their father, supported and likely egged on by their mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Henry II was able to put down the rebellion, but it wasn't exactly an indication of family unity. The king made a show of peace with his sons, but not with their mother, committing Eleanor to a variety of prisons for the rest of her life. After young Henry died in 1182, more family trouble broke out. The king agreed Richard would be the heir, but ordered him to give Aquitaine to John. Richard, who had spent years in Aquitaine, refused. Henry ordered Geoffrey and John to take the area by force, but that war ended in a stalemate. Only when the king brought Eleanor into the discussion would Richard agree. Geoffrey died in 1186, leaving only Richard and John to battle over Henry's favor and possessions. When Henry refused to publicly acknowledge Richard as his heir, Richard joined with Philip, son of the French king, his mother's ex, to attack Henry's forces. The king finally agreed to compromise with Philip, and he recognized Richard as heir. When he learned his favorite son John was on Richard's side, King Henry II collapsed and died the 6th of July, 1189. Both surviving sons eventually took the throne. Richard's reign is considered very successful mostly due to the work of his mother, Eleanor, to burnish his reputation and rule England on his behalf, while Richard focused on the Crusades. Richard has gone on to become a popular figure, and as the Lionheart is often included in lists of the top monarchs of English history. He had no children, so after his death in 1199, John took the throne. There has only been one King John, and it's probably just as well. He is typically considered a bad king and often often ends up on lists of the worst monarchs in English history. So, Henry produced many sons and created a dynasty. Mm, not a bad start. Edward III. And now, on to Edward III. Edward didn't come from a happy family himself. His mother and father were not on the best of terms, to say the least. And his mother, Queen Isabella, worked with her special friend, Roger Mortimer, to depose Edward II and place young Edward on the throne. He was crowned at Westminster Abbey in 1327 at age 14. Fortunately for him, his mother chose Philippa of Hainault to be his wife, and that turned out to be an excellent move. Supported by his wife in 1330, Edward III asserted his own power, executing Mortimer, and banishing mother Isabella. Edward III's first son, Edward, was born that year as well. Edward and Philippa produced 13 children, nine of whom lived to adulthood. Among these were four spare heirs, Lionel, John, Edmund, and Thomas. Spoiler alert, you'll hear these names again. Edward's reign was defined by the Hundred Years' War with the French, which he instigated when he claimed the throne of France in 1337. In the early part of his reign, he was as successful at the war as he was at everything else. Victories in France, honor at home, sons everywhere. Looks like a great candidate for father and king of the century. As things went on in a very long reign, it's not surprising there were some stumbles. After all, if you do anything for 65 years, you're likely to make mistakes. Things with the war against the French went really well for a while with impressive victories at Crecy and Calais. But the alliances were costly and the Black Death struck with a vengeance, wiping out approximately a third of the English population. Military failures piled up in the later years of Edward's reign. There was political strife at home as well, with a population tired of paying for a war that never ended. 
Edward started turning more responsibility over to his sons. Edward, the Prince of Wales and heir to the throne, was an extraordinary warrior and is credited with many French victories. During the long campaign at Aquitaine, Prince Edward suffered, suffered heavy losses in France, and it seems his brother, John of Gaunt, was working against him in England. His young son died, and his own health began to deteriorate. Edward, Prince of Wales, known as the Black Prince, supposedly because he wore black armor all the time, died in September 1376. That meant his younger son, Richard, was now heir to the throne. King Edward was devastated by his son's, his eldest son's death. As military campaigns abroad failed, discontent at home increased. The king was aging and his health was failing. John of Gaunt was virtually in control of the government and he was being targeted by the commons and parliament. In this time of chaos, Edward III died in June 1377. He must have realized his death would make things worse. The new king would be his 10-year-old grandson, Richard. There were many achievements in the reign of Edward III. He created the Order of the Garter and bolstered a sense of community among the great peers of the land. The reinforcement of the aristocracy led to a sense of national identity, which was supported by all those early victories in France. He was popular throughout his reign, and he certainly provided the nation with ambitious leaders in his many sons. Nearly a hundred years after the death of Edward III, his descendants would be locked in their own battles against each other. But that, of course, is a story for another day. Henry VIII. Next up, Henry VIII, one of the most famous and infamous royal fathers. The obsession of his life and his reign was laser focused on the goal of producing a son. To get there, Henry VIII abandoned one wife, beheaded another, turned the kingdom upside down and inside out, broke with Rome, declared himself supreme head of the Church of England, and set himself firmly on the road to tyranny. So after all that effort to have a son, what kind of father was he? Surprisingly, according to contemporary reports, Henry was a more active father early in his reign with his first child, daughter, Princess Mary. For many years, Henry had a warm relationship with Mary, and there are many descriptions of them spending time together and his carrying Mary around. He also spent time with his daughter, Princess Elizabeth, after her birth, although not as much. It's interesting that we don't see many reports of Henry carrying Edward around or spending the time with him that he used to do with Mary, and to a lesser degree, Elizabeth. But that doesn't mean Edward wasn't important to the king. Just the opposite. Edward's birth was one of the highlights of Henry's reign. The king staged an elaborate christening ceremonies at Hampton Court Palace, going to extreme lengths to have a special structure built so the christening font could be seen by all the people invited to participate. The baby prince was carried to the font in a grand procession that included high-ranking members of the court and clergy, foreign ambassadors, and the prince's two half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth. It was one of the most spectacular events to take place during Henry's reign. Edward received the best of everything, the best care, the best food, the best protection. He had the best teachers the king could find. He had the most caring household and the most attentive royal staff. Edward's every wish seems to have been granted, and he was indulged in every way. It was a far different experience from that of his sisters, of course. But after Edward's birth, life seems to have settled for Henry's daughters as well. The king officially returned both his daughters to the line of succession in the Third Succession Act of 1543. That act stated that after the death of Edward and any children he might have, and the deaths of any children the king and Catherine Parr, his current wife, might have, and the deaths of any children the king might have with any future wife, seriously, Henry, Mary would be next in line. After the deaths of Mary and any children she might have, Elizabeth would be next. In addition to establishing this by law, Henry VIII devoted the majority of his will to reinforcing his succession plan and then dictating how the succession would continue past Elizabeth and her potential children. So, eventually, Henry VIII has all three of his legitimate su surviving children in his plan for the succession. 
and eventually all three of them take the throne. That is unprecedented. No other royal father has all three surviving children take the throne. So, was Henry a success as a father after all? He would most certainly say yes. But many of you disagree, as evidenced by the responses I got to the unofficial study I did on social media. Prince Albert. Our next royal father was never king himself, but he was father of a king and some queens, grandfather of many royals across Europe. In fact, had he lived, he might have been called the grandfather of Europe. His wife was definitely called the grandmother of Europe. I'm speaking of Prince Albert, the consort of Queen Victoria. When Victoria, William IV's niece, came to the throne of England, the country was ready to see a young couple and children as a royal family. Victoria and Albert were married in a grand ceremony in February 1840 at St. James's Palace. Albert's role in the royal family was initially unclear. As prince consort, what exactly was he supposed to do? He expressed that concern himself, writing, quote, I am very happy and contented, but the difficulty in filling my place with a proper dignity is that I am only the husband, not the master in the house. Victoria was queen, and in their household, that was the title and the person who mattered. However, once Victoria got pregnant, Albert started to take on public roles and become more involved in government business. And Victoria was pregnant a lot. Even though she was a very small woman, and pregnancy was still very dangerous for mother and child at this time, Victoria managed to become pregnant and successfully deliver nine children. Between 1840 and 1850 alone, Victoria had seven children. This meant she was either pregnant, recovering from birth, or breastfeeding almost constantly during the first years of her marriage. Some recent historians wonder if the constant motherhood and pregnancy was a way for Albert to create a place for himself and a way to be master of the house. He certainly took advantage of the queen's pregnancy and time bearing and caring for babies to expand his role in government and governing. Albert was a modernizer, and he used his influence to reorganize and streamline royal household and finances. He became chancellor of the University of Cambridge and reformed the university curricula. He led reforms in welfare and supported the campaign against slavery. He organized the exhibition of the Society of Arts into the Great Exhibition of 1851, which proved an international success. His influence was also felt strongly in the family sphere. He was the one who oversaw the education of his children. He was particularly devoted to his eldest daughter, Vicky, and appreciated her quick mind and desire to learn. By contrast, his eldest son and Victoria's heir, Prince Albert, the Prince of Wales, did not respond well to this demanding curriculum. The prince, who was known as Bertie to his family and friends, was also less serious in his personal life, something that Albert despaired of. He expected his children to embrace his view of a happy, productive family and to take that into their own families. Although Prince Albert only lived long enough to see one of his children marry and have children of her own, he and Victoria had a big plan for their offspring. Disturbed by the Napoleonic Wars and determined to do all he could to prevent all that from happening again, Albert had a vision of a grand council of siblings and cousins ruling Europe and beyond. Of course, the problem was being related to each other doesn't necessarily mean getting along. So even though Victoria and Albert's children married the royal families of Europe, by the time of World War I, the family was torn apart and facing off against each other with devastating consequences. So, ultimately, mixed results for Albert's fatherhood. George VI. Our final father is quite recent. George VI, the father of the current queen. Albert Frederick Arthur George, known as Albert or Bertie to his family and friends, was born the 14th of December, 1895 at Sandringham during the reign of Queen Victoria. He was fourth in line to the throne 
after his grandfather, who would become Edward VII, his father, who would become George V, and his older brother, who would become Edward VIII. When Edward VII died in 1910, Albert's father became the king and his brother became the Prince of Wales. Albert himself became the Duke of York. He served in World War I, although his time in combat was limited by his illness. However, he continued his training and became the first royal prince to be certified as a fully qualified pilot. After the war, Albert fell in love with Elizabeth Bowes-Lyon, the youngest daughter of the Earl of Strathmore. He was determined to marry her and proposed. She turned him down twice, not relishing the idea of marrying the Duke and becoming a duchess. But he persisted and eventually prevailed. The pair were married on the 26th of April, 1923. The country celebrated the wedding and became enchanted by the young couple. Their first child, Princess Elizabeth, was born in April 1926, and sister Princess Margaret Rose followed in 1930. The family was a happy one, representing the love and acceptance Albert has lacked, had lacked as a child. The Duke and Duchess were devoted parents, taking their daughters with them on outings and sharing family photos and videos with the public. With the death of George V in 1936, the Prince of Wales became King Edward VIII and Albert became heir to the throne. Most people expected the new king to settle down and find an appropriate wife now that he was on the throne. But they hadn't factored in his devotion to the woman already in his life, Wallace Simpson. Refusing to give her up, King Edward VIII was issued an ultimatum, Wallace or the crown. The king abdicated, saying he couldn't face the trials of ruling without the woman he loved. So Albert reluctantly became the King of England. He took the royal name George and was crowned King George VI on the 12th of May, 1937, the day originally planned for the coronation of his brother Edward. With war looming, the country in chaos, and the monarchy at risk, King George relied on his sense of dedication and duty, his deep religious belief, and the love and support of his family. The king's family was his top priority. He referred to them as us four and continued to keep them close throughout his reign. He was dedicated to preparing his daughter Elizabeth for the one day that she would eventually take the throne. Knowing the fear of being unprepared himself, he wanted Elizabeth to be confidently prepared when the time came. During the war, the royal family represented a sense of the commitment that echoed the duty of the king. When asked if the two princesses would be evacuated from London, London during the worst of the bombing, the queen replied, the children will not go unless I do. I shall not leave without the king, and the king will not leave in any circumstances whatever. The king is said to have described Elizabeth as his pride and Margaret as his joy. When Princess Elizabeth married Philip Mountbatten in 1947, the king wrote her a personal letter about his feelings of pride as he walked her down the aisle. Quote, I have watched you grow up all those years with pride under the skillful direction of a mummy who, as you know, is the most marvelous person in the world in my eyes. And now I can, I know, always count on you and now Philip to help us in our work. He closes by saying how much he'll miss her and asking her to come back as often as possible. It's easy to see how George VI's dedication to his family benefited his daughter and his nation. The queen the nation's longest reigning monarch and someone who has weathered her share of trials and challenges has always credited her father as an inspiration for dedication and service. So who is your choice for best royal father? We've seen a few rebels and at least one real romantic among these royals. Thank you for joining me. Next week, we'll be flipping it a bit to consider what happens when the king dies young and the child comes to the throne too soon. Missing fathers and their impact. Coming next week. See you then. Thank you for joining us for this discussion of fun and dysfunctional families of British history. As always, please subscribe, rate, share, and let me know what you think. I really appreciate it. Now watch out for our summer specials as we keep exploring those royals, rebels, and romantics. 
and stay tuned for season two coming in September 2021. It's going to be amazing. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for making season one a success. Please plan now to keep shaking up history with me. (laughs) 